some tropical uh, planktivorous uh, shark, totally harmless. Uh, it's twice the size of the largest great white shark. Uh, so we're really talking about a pretty substantial animal. They grow to sizes of about 45 feet, although as is often the case we're learning with a lot of these marine megafauna, actually saying how big things get uh, is a simple question with complex answers. I was just part of a paper submitted by Craig McLean, my fellow editor from Deep Sea News, about how we measure the size of the largest animals in the ocean, things like giant squids and, uh, and, and giant clams and giant sponges and whale sharks, and all about the, the difference between measuring for central tendency and measuring for maximum sizes, and whether it's meaningful to ask what is the biggest whale shark ever recorded. It may not be a meaningful question at all, but suffice to say, this is the biggest shark that we know of, uh, and it may grow as much as 60 feet in length, although animals like that probably are uh, exceedingly rare, and a large animal these days would probably be in the 40 to 45 foot range. Those animals are seen pretty frequently in places like the Galapagos. There's been a, a veritable explosion of interest scientifically in whale sharks over the last 20 or so years. It's really interesting to notice that, that before about the Second World War period, the only records of whale sharks in existence uh, were basically locality records. We saw a whale shark in this place, or we saw a whale shark in that place. If you think about it, that's a pretty uh, unsophisticated approach to the world's largest animal. You would have hoped we would know more about it by then. And I, I have to tell you that even though we've, we've gone up quite nicely in sort of CO2 fashion uh, towards the end of this, uh, that we still actually have gaping questions about whale sharks. And a lot of this stuff in the middle here is still basic natural history stuff about where we see them. Uh, what's happened at the end here with this jump up represents two things. One is the discovery of the phenomenon of coastal whale shark aggregations. That's this idea that whale sharks aren't these solitary open ocean behemoths that we thought they were, that there are several places in the world, about 12 we're up to now, where whale sharks reliably gather within easy accessible distance of the coast and that sets you up to start research planning, right? You can, if you know that you're in Belize at the right time of year, you're going to see whale sharks. Uh, that means you can plan and you can you'd start to design uh, experiments and observations around scientific questions that relate to this species, whereas previously it was pretty much a serendipitous activity. If you saw one, you might be able to do some science on the spot, but uh, you couldn't really plan for it. The other thing that's embedded in this hockey stick end of the graph here is uh, some of the technological advances that go with uh, tagging and animal telemetry, uh, particularly satellite tags and GPS tags that allow us to say what whale sharks are doing when nobody's watching because you can't be with them all the time. And it's great that you can go out there, intersect with an animal's life however briefly, and then you can both go on your separate ways, but you can keep track of where they're going because they're basically swimming around with a waterproof iPhone on their back. <clears throat> We're very lucky at George Aquarium to have four whale sharks in our collection. Uh, to do that, we had to build one of the largest uh, tanks in the world. We don't use the word tank, we use exhibit. Uh, but it's not a tank, actually, because the, it's quite true to say that the uh, aquarium building is built around the exhibit. Uh, it's not a tank that was placed inside a building. So we have four of these things. The tank that we have them in is about the size of a football field. How many of you guys have been to George Aquarium? Okay, so quite a few of you have seen the whale sharks, and the rest of you have some homework come up to Atlanta and see uh, this, because this is the only place outside East Asia where you can see this species in an aquarium. And to be frank, for the 20 million guests or so that we've had through since we opened in 2005, this is the only time they're ever going to see a whale shark in their life. So it's a very important uh, responsibility that we take quite seriously to, to amaze them with this collection, but then also take that opportunity to teach them something that they didn't know about whale sharks. And that means that we ourselves had to go out and find some stuff out because there really wasn't all that much that we knew. I wish I could take some time today to tell you all about how the whale sharks came to be in Atlanta because that's a cool story in and of itself, but I've only got a couple of slides worth for that. Suffice to say that they came from Taiwan. Uh, so if you think about it, it was really just the craziest idea. We're going to build the biggest aquarium in the world in a landlocked city five hours from the coast, uh, and then we're going to get the largest animal that lives in the ocean that's not a, a marine mammal, and we're going to source them from the exact opposite side of the globe. <laughs> Uh, and then bring them to Atlanta. It was, it was really a silly idea. So, but a tremendous logistical uh, achievement, and it was actually one of the privileges of my career to work with some of the very creative people that solved a lot of the logistical challenges of doing this. Uh, and I, I really, I've never seen such unified focus. It was a fascinating time uh, and uh, a lot of fun to be part of. Uh, when you move a whale shark, you can't lift them out of the water. They have a cartilage skeleton. They're not designed to support their own body weight when you lift them out of the water. They don't have bones the way we do. So when you lift a whale shark, you lift them in these bladder stretches with water. So they're in there. 
Um, thankfully, they're a good species to move uh, because they're one of the shark species that's capable of respirating, of uh, ventilating their own gills. They can, they can move water through their own gills through active pumping. And they don't have a rigid gill basket like a white shark or a mako. So that really helps you because once they're in the box, they can look after their own respiration. You just have to make sure that the dissolved oxygen concentration stays high and you have to take care of some other water quality parameters. These boxes are uh, uh, engineering marvels. I could talk about those all day, but I don't have time. So we've now done this three times. You park them uh, side by side. I always thought you'd put them tandem, right, inside the belly of the plane. No, you put them side by side right over the wings. That's uh, a weight distribution thing. You can just about pass a piece of paper through the corner here. Uh, that's about all. Uh, and they are really jammed in tight there. I really like this picture also because it shows uh, three of our uh, senior management staff, and they're all on some kind of electronic device uh, because the logistics surrounding doing this is, is really uh, quite remarkably complex. Uh, but the net result that we're going for is that you finally get these animals to land. It takes about 40 hours from end to end, uh, and then we release them into uh, what was at that time the largest aquarium in the world since being surpassed by a couple of other places. Uh, uh, but still a very, very large exhibit. It's about 300 feet long, and there's the whale shark there, happily swimming around in its new home. Uh, so I said we'd move whale sharks three times. The astute of you will put together the math that that's six whale sharks, and I told you we have four whale sharks. That's because the first two whale sharks that we collected uh, and had in the, in the aquarium didn't survive. They both died in 2007. And I have to tell you that was very rough for everybody who worked at the aquarium at the time, uh, but... For a scientist like me, it's been a bit of a gold mine, and I'm still publishing science based on those animals. Uh, and this is a good example that has a USF connection. Phil Moda, a uh, functional anatomist, uh, he uh, published a paper with some co-authors from the aquarium based on the filtration apparatus from inside the mouth of the whale shark. One of the things we didn't know was how do, how do whale sharks separate plankton from the water. It obviously is not the same way that baleen whales do it, where they, they have that baleen dangling from the top jaw. They don't have that. They have something else. They have these filter pads, but nobody knew how they worked. So Phil was able to take material from the animals that died at the aquarium and do some studies to, to try to understand how that works. This is what the filtration pad looks like if you look up close. It's not a solid screen with circular holes punched in it. It's more of a meandering wall with sort of projections that, that, that circumscribe these pore spaces. And it's really important that those pore spaces have an average diameter of about 1.9 millimetres. That's important because their average food product determined from gastric samples and fecal samples is about 0.2 millimetres. So how is an animal eating food that is smaller than the pore sizes in its filter? And that was a bit of a mystery that, uh, that Phil was able to solve. Uh, and it works like this. Most filters, when you think about filters, you think about a deadhead filter. This is like the pasta colander where you, you, know, you pour the noodles out, the water goes through, the noodles are retained on the screen, and then you have dinner. Uh, these guys don't work that way. They have a system whereby the water flows not through the filter but across the surface of the filter, and the water is dragged out through uh, those uh, holes, uh, and surface tension drags the molecules behind the leading molecules, and the water is siphoned out that way. And the particles, which have more momentum, carry on in an ever more concentrated stream as you get to the back of their mouth. And the back of a mouth of a whale shark is a lot further back than you think. Uh, so if you think about the whale shark's anatomy, the back of their pectoral fins is about where their throat starts. Everything in front of that is mouth. Um, I can tell you, I've put my arm in there and waved it around and I could not reach the back. So it is a, it's a capacious mouth and the filters are not held perpendicular to the water flow. Uh, they're very much acutely angled to the water flow and the water is flowing across it. The best analogy I can give you uh, is it's m very much like how a plankton net works where the plankton net f filters the water out through the sides and the plankton get ever more concentrated until they end up in the cot end. So very similar idea. Shock horror that, that a whale shark filter should work like a plankton net. Uh, or rather, maybe the other way around, because I'm pretty sure they thought of it first. <laughs> so we've been able to do some stuff with the live ones as well. Uh, this is me uh, taking blood from one of our whale sharks. Uh, I've got a hopelessly small-looking needle here. Uh, it's actually not a needle for drawing blood. This is a needle for augering a hole through their skin, which is incredibly tough, so that I can then use another needle to get the blood sample. What you can't really tell is that I'm wearing giant inflatable waders and I'm floating in 25 feet of water and these guys are there to make sure that I don't float away because it's awfully hard to stick a needle in a, a shark that, while you're floating. So uh, even simple things like getting a blood sample in the beginning took us about 80 people and about four and a half hours to get a blood sample. 
by the end, we were super efficient. We had it down to about 35 people in about two hours. So <laughs> still uh, not, uh, not a simple thing to do. Uh, these days, we've worked out from our Japanese colleagues how to do it with one person on scuba without restraining the animal at all, which is extraordinary <coughs> ability to do. I haven't managed to pull that one off myself yet, but I'll get there. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me while I indulge in this awesome tradition of having beer during <laughs> seminar. I've never had that anywhere else. It's great. <laughs> uh, so we published the, the first paper describing the blood cells of, of whale sharks. And a lot of stuff that's happening with whale sharks is simple, descriptive work. We just described their white cell differential. These are what the white cells that they have. This is what they look like. Here's some measurements. We didn't have any idea about function. We still don't know the difference between what their eosinophils do and what their heterophils do. We can infer some things from other species, but to be honest, we really don't know. I think we're pretty safe to assume that their lymphocytes function like lymphocytes and everything else, which is that they're, they're antibody cells. Uh, but yeah, just simple stuff like that, describing the white cell differential. Had never been done before because nobody had ever taken blood from a whale shark. <clears throat> so after we got done with the cells, things got a little bit more nuanced and I started to get the scientist in me came out a little bit. So I went down the road to Georgia Tech where there were some people there uh, who were able to help us tease apart the chemistry of whale shark blood a little better. With those two animals that were getting sick, standard clinical chemistry panels were telling us that those animals were fine. I mean, clearly they were not fine. They hadn't eaten for several months and they were in bad shape. So uh, I had a feeling that those clinical chemistry panels were simply looking at the wrong chemicals. And so I had to go back and ask a first principle question, what is in whale shark blood? And it turns out that there's a great suite of techniques called metabolomics that can help you answer that question. If you know someone who has NMR spectroscope or a mass spec or both, um, and that's what they have down the road at Georgia Tech. So I've now fallen into this role of connecting people with really cool techniques uh, with a really cool collection that we have and, and injecting some cool questions and then we come up with these very productive collaborations. So we found that we were able to separate the, <coughs> the unhealthy whale sharks from the healthy whale sharks uh, using the uh, metabolomic discrimination of, of their blood chemistry. And then we were able to look at what was driving those differences, which individual chemicals were making them different. And we identified about 26 biomarkers of health in whale sharks based on the chemistry of their blood, none of which were included in the original clinical chemistry panels. So really very productive study. More recently, uh, we've had a lot of fun with uh, a genome project. Uh, that we've got a whale shark genome project. This is the, the mitochondrial genome of the whale shark in comparison with uh, a dozen or so other shark species. Uh, and so we used tissues from those first two whale sharks that died uh, to create uh, paired end libraries. And we, uh, with folks at Emory University, we just finished the assembly three days ago, for those of you who are genome people. It's the first shark to have its genome completely sequenced and it's very exciting for us as aquarium people to be involved in science with a capital S, right? Genome projects is not normally considered to be in the realm of aquarium science. We do small s science plus big C conservation. Uh, this is capital S science and it's really, it's a hoot for me to be uh, part of that sort of stuff. I have no idea what's going on a lot of the time when I talk to them about the, the nitty gritty of how genome sequencing works. Uh, but I know enough to know that it's, uh, it's amazing uh, technology that they have and that it is a really interesting species to sequence for us. The group that's particularly interested at Emory is uh, big into comparative immunogenomics. So they want to look at the origins of the human immune system. And since the shark lineage was the first group to evolve antibodies, uh, it's a great place to start looking if you want to understand the origins of antibodies. That group has already looked at the uh, genomic basis for the absence of antibodies in the last lineage before this, which is the jawless fishes, the hagfishes and lampreys. Uh, and so we've now sort of bookended that important change from having no jaws to jaws and having no antibodies to having antibodies. And so we think there might be some fertile uh, research ground in the, in the genome of whale sharks with regard, specific regards to immunology. But to be honest, uh, the really fun stuff happens in the field. And what's, this is where it gets really crazy because with this species, we've been able to do really basic stuff, really basic field natural history at the same time as we do this advanced, you know, omic type things uh, back at, at the ranch. So it's really cool to be able to work on a species on multiple fronts like that. For most of the last 10 years, our field research has been focused at this one extraordinary site at the northeastern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And I love to go down there two or three times a year to work with this collection of animals that they have there. So this is the city of Cancun, the artificial city of Cancun. Uh, completely created as a tourist destination 
and now uh, spreading to invade the, pretty much the entire Mayan Riviera uh, with development and tourism and so on. Very, very popular tourist destination. We knew back in uh, the very early 2000s, right around when the aquarium opened actually, that there were groups of whale sharks that were seen over here in this famous place called Isla Holbosch. And for a lot of people, Holbosch is synonymous with whale sharks. But those groups were small inshore aggregations of maybe one to two dozen animals. What happened when we really started looking was that we found this other aggregation that nobody knew about uh, further offshore that was really extraordinary. This is by far the largest aggregation of whale sharks ever observed anywhere. Uh, the biggest day we ever had was 420 whale sharks in the same place at the same time, which is about 10 times more than it had ever been seen anywhere else. And so it was really wild for us to be out there and to see this unfolding in front of us and to know that what we were seeing was completely unprecedented. And so we had lots of basic questions about wh what's happening here? Why are these animals here? What are they doing? Uh, and so it was really cool to, to be a part of that process and to work with the people who uh, helped us to understand it. This is what we were seeing at that Afuera location, crystal clear blue water, random patch of pelagic ocean. You'd just drive around for like 17 miles and then you'd find 300 whale sharks in this random patch of ocean that didn't look particularly different to anything else. <coughs> but it was because you put out a plankton net and uh, you, can, you only have to tow for 20 or 30 seconds and the plankton people among you might guess what we found, which was fish eggs. Lots and lots of fish eggs. The same fish egg every time. We've had its uh, gene sequence several times. It's been... Um, that's been uh, barcoded, and it always comes out to the same species, which is this little tiny Euthinus alliteratus. A small tuna, they call Benito down there, that nobody's particularly interested in eating, but it seems to be, have a really important association with whale sharks. What's really wild about this is we've never seen this fish in appreciable numbers down there. We've seen them in fours and fives hanging around underneath whale sharks, but this has to be the mother of all spawning events uh, because it supports hundreds of whale sharks for about four and a half months every summer. Uh, doing nothing but sucking down eggs all day, every day. So sometime when we're not watching, probably at night, a huge school of these things is coming together for some spawning event uh, and then disappearing before we get to them in the morning when the sun comes up. I'm rather pessimistic about ever finding it, but gee, I'd really like to see it because it must be something special to behold. The idea that this crazy aggregation of whale sharks is a symptom of something else that's even bigger and more amazing is really a pretty seductive idea to me. And I'd really like to see that one day. <coughs> this is what it looks like from the air. It's a 40-foot uh, fishing boat over here. So most of these animals are in the range of, so this is a small animal, maybe 13, 14 feet, larger animals in the, the 23 to 27 foot range. But the important thing about this is all of these animals are immature. This is a sub-adult aggregation and two thirds of them are male. So this is not, we from the one female that was ever necropsy that was pregnant that the, her embryos had a 50-50 sex ratio so we're pretty sure that they they have even sex ratio not in this aggregation it is male dominated and they're all uh, juveniles just like the ones we have at Georgia Aquarium even though they're in 20 sometimes even 30 feet long the vast majority of them not mature so even though it's a great place to go and study them we are studying demographically one tiny sliver of the real whale shark population. So most of that hockey stick graph I showed you at the beginning is based on studying the kids smoking behind a school shed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I really want to find the singles bar where they're all uh, getting together for some hanky-panky because nobody's ever seen whale sharks mating and nobody's ever seen whale sharks giving birth. And those are two of the biggest gaps in our knowledge about this biology of the species. If you take the plane up a little bit higher, this is what you see. These are some, some boats. There are six boats in this photo. Uh, and then the rest of these little apostrophe looking things are all whale sharks. And it's hard for you to appreciate. I marked them all for you. And I can tell you that there's 173 <laughs> whale sharks in this picture. So, and in fact, I've, I've noticed a couple more that I didn't mark that should be marked on there. So maybe 175. Suffice to say, a whole lot of whale sharks in one place at once. The other thing I really want you to notice is those six boats. The ratio of boats to whale sharks because things have changed, unfortunately. So a lot of what we've done down there involves the telemetry, those tools that I told you about before. We go out and put tags on things. This is me putting a tag on uh, uh, a large female that we call Lucy. Uh, and uh, so this tag is going to follow her around. And in fact, her tag came off at the, the flower garden banks uh, just off Texas. And the tag washed ashore in uh, Galveston Bay. So, uh, so we learned most of those animals actually have a similar pattern to that. We know where they're going, where they're coming from now. So the basic story goes a bit like this. They, they sort of appear in southern Mesoamerica, spend some time in Honduras and Belize before they show up where we work in Mexico, 
and then they follow the Yucatan current around the Gulf of Mexico where there's another aggregation at the mouth of the Mississippi. What are they doing there? Hey, they're feeding on little tiny eggs. What do you know? <laughs> it seems that there is a tight association between these two species. It must be tough to be a little tiny and know that two-thirds of your spawning effort's going straight down the cavernous moor of the biggest <laughs> plankton-eating predator that you can Im imagine. So uh, after that, we kind of lose them a little bit. We think they come down the west coast of Florida, but by this time, uh, the tags have either run out of batteries or they've fallen off. It's actually really hard to keep these tags on for any decent amount of time. The skin on whale sharks is incredibly thick and tough. Uh, it's hard to get the tags to stay on. It's possible they go around the western end of Cuba and, and come back. Uh, we don't know to what degree this population is connected to the rest of the Atlantic. There are whale sharks throughout the Atlantic. There are whale sharks throughout the world. But we don't know about the connectivity with this group, which we know is all one group, uh, how much that connects with animals that we see in Ascension, uh, St. Helena, St. Peter and St. Paul rocks, Francisco de Noronha, these very remote locations in the South Atlantic. We don't know how these populations are connected, if they are connected at all. We do know we had one female who was a little unusual. She kicked the system, Rio lady. She was tagged by Bob Huda from Moat Marine Lab with uh, some financial support from the aquarium. And he, she went uh, exactly the opposite direction. She didn't go to the Gulf of Mexico at all. She swam straight to St. Peter and St. Paul Rocks where her tag came off some 4,000 miles later. Uh, really extraordinary migration. And I think that is a migration. Why is she out there? Well, we think she, she is one of the few big mature females that we see. That's why we tagged her. So <clears throat> we think she probably goes to these places for some other part of the reproductive cycle. Really cool thing is that she's been back to, uh, to uh, the Edgware location a couple of times. And I was able to put another tag on her. This is last year. We put a real-time tag on her. And I really enjoyed that process because we connected this tag to a Twitter account. So every time this tag hit off a satellite, it automatically generated a tweet of the, the um, coordinates for where she was in that moment. Unfortunately, the tag, uh, <laughs> the tag came off and it's now somewhere in the suburbs of Dallas. Um, <laughs> I've been <laughs> engaged in a, a mainstream media campaign to try and get that tag back. Somebody found it in Galveston and took it back to Dallas, and I'm still trying to find that person because it's still pinging reliably. <laughs> <coughs> so if you know anybody who lives in Louisville, just outside Dallas, uh, <laughs> they have my tag, and I'd really like to get it back. So, uh, so we also have some other tag, and this is a behavior tag. It's a homemade tag. So this is a high-resolution accelerometry tag. So this one's not for asking where do animals go when they leave Mexico. This one's for asking what is this animal doing Right now, how is it interacting with us? How is it interacting with the ecotourism boats? How is it interacting with other whale sharks? The data looks quite different. This is a, a good example. Hopefully, I can get this to...